4.37 p.m. Let the record reflect that Alder uh, Burnett, Alder Galvin, Alder Hutchison, and Alder Johnson are all present. Entertain a motion for approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. We have a motion by Galvin, second by Burnett. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Approval of minutes. So moved. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion by Galvin, a second by Burnett. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Item E, regular pricing providing for the sale and issuance of $14,475,000 general obligation corporate purchase bond series 2022A and all related details. Uh, we've covered this item a number of times. I think this is just a formality. Are there any questions? We get a motion. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion by Galvin, second by Brunette. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Item two, resolution authorizing and providing for the sale and issuance of 3825000 general obligation promissory note series 2022B and all related details. Again, this has been previously covered. Any questions for staff? All right, can we get a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion by Galvin. I'm going to give the second to Hutchison. Even though he's a little slow, I'll give it to him. I'm going to touch uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Consideration with possible action of approval on the renewal of the City of Green Bay copier lease agreement. Staff? All right, um, thank you. Um, I am going to look to see if our procurement manager is on the line. Um, I am not seeing him on the line at the, at the moment. Basically, um, it looks like have... we're getting a good deal on printing black and white and color copies. Yep, it's a new a new contract. We are beginning going to be getting some new equipment, um, and we have ch we're changed the process. We used to have it where they would bill us on a monthly basis, and then at, we in October, which is a terrible time for budget time, we would get the true up to see really what happened throughout the year. And so we're going to go back to actually getting billed actuals during the month. So uh, we'll know halfway through the year if we have a department that maybe is going over or um, having some issues. But yeah, rate rate wise because their contract um, that the, the pricing had come in much better. And again, our, our new procurement manager kind of um, kind of worked a deal with them and uh, it's going to actually save us some money over time over the three-year contract. I mean, to me, this just looked like pretty standard time for renewal, um, yep. cost of doing business. But I mean, if there's any other questions. Motion to approve. Second. All right, we have a motion by Galvin. And a second, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item four, for consideration of possible action, a request to approve a bid award for the official newspaper of the City of Green Bay to the lowest response of responsible bidder, which is uh, Press Times. Staff? Um, again, I thought our procurement manager was going to speak to this, so I will speak to it as much as I can. Um, this has been every year, the, this is an annual thing that needs to be done, um, that we have to go out for the official newspaper. Um, I, every year we have the discussion, should we, now that press times is a consideration, um, we have to decide whether or not we want to go with the press because that are press times. And so press times numbers, um, prices is better. Their circulation has gotten a little bit larger. And um, so the recommendation, because they really have a, they had a responsible and responsive, um, you know, um, bid um, for this, for this contract um, is to go to the press times. However, our clerk, was not able to join us tonight um, said that um, the state statute says that due to liquor licenses it has to be a daily print paper and so right now the press time is only a weekly print paper um, so at this point we would we could still go with the press times with the consideration that we will need to follow state statute for liquor licenses so right now it would be a hybrid approach at this point I'm I see our procurement manager is jumping online at this as at the moment. So um, we'll see if you have. So that is that's the approach. That is what um, that is our recommendation um, right now on the on this contract. Tom, we are actually on item number 
four, which is the official newspaper. I kind of explain the situation, so I don't know if I'm alders have any questions on the newspaper. Are there any questions, Alder Hutchison? You're you're new. I mean, this is something that we go through every year. State statute requires it. Yeah, um, yeah. and and the numbers do look uh, smaller for the Press Times. Um, so this isn't going to be a problem if we go with them for standard notification and do something different for liquor licenses. That's correct. Uh, Tom, I don't know if you want to step in there or not, but I did I did go look at, you know, uh, it looks like we have other surrounding municipalities that are using press times for their public notices. But then when I went and researched, it does not look like they're using it for liquor license or at least some of the larger uh, surrounding municipalities following suit. So I believe we have the option for liquor license. We can post them in both papers or we would at this point, we'd still have to go to um, um, the Press Gazette for liquor licenses. So again, we were looking at a hybrid approach. Approach. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, the peer's been using them for at least a year or two. Okay. Are there any other questions for staff? Motion to approve. I'll, I'll second. All right. We have a motion by Galvin, a second by Hutchison. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we are moving on to item number five, report out the purchase of rain barrels approved at Earthmark LLC for 36400 I see Melissa Schmitz is on the line. Yes, so the low bid was $36,400, and that is for the purchase of 520 rain barrels with diverter kits. And a diverter kit is what attaches the rain barrel to your downspout. And um, the, the lead time, once we have the purchase order, will be four to six weeks. The program, uh, this was uh, approved uh, with ARPA money um, back in February 1st by Common Council. So this is just a report out. DPW is working, we're working on a registration and distribution process um, once the rain barrels arrive. So just a, a quick question. We authorized 60,000. Clearly, I, I assume the bids came maybe lower than expected or we're just ordering fewer um, units. When that request, that Arbor request was made, that was actually for rain barrels and a rain garden initiative. So the balance of the funds, um, $24,000 and some change will be used to fund the rain garden program. Okay, and that was my question. I didn't know if it was gonna return back to the ARPA fund, but you've answered that. Is there's a second part to this? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're still working on getting the finer points of the Rain Garden program worked out. There's any questions, discussion? If not, we'll entertain and, a motion oh. to receive and place on file. Brian. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry, Alder Johnson. Could I ask a question? Uh, yep. Go ahead, Alder Grant. Um, do we have to purchase all of them at once or can we do by like 100 intervals to make sure we have the demand? Um, that's not how the project was bid out and it was actually more cost to buy in this quantity versus 100 because they are shipped in a semi um, from Ohio. And so the price per unit was more cost effective to purchase 500 uh, 20 barrels, and I'm fairly confident that the demand will be quite high for these. Okay, do we have a plan if they aren't all picked up, I guess? Well, we have That's three right. We have three years to implement the the funding through ARPA. So if, if for some reason the uptake is a little slow for the first summer, you know, for the, this first season, um, Typically, you know, if that's the case, it takes two to three years to really get a program up and running where you have um, a more of that, I, I guess, recognition that it exists. Um, in social media, I, again, I don't see that we are going to be left with um, rain barrels on our hands. Okay, and I apologize if this was covered in a prior meeting. Are the in storage wise, are we having any issues of? Nope. Oh, we have that all covered. DPW storing them on South Broadway. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Alder oh, Burnett? Yeah, I think uh, the motion on the floor was to approve, but it's a report out, so would it be more appropriate to receive yep, and place just receive file? and place on file. Yeah, I'd make that motion. All right, can we second? I'll second. All right, we have a motion by Alder Burnett to receive and place on file, second by Alder Hutchison. Any further discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Well, opposed, motion carries, item six. <clears throat> For consideration with possible action, the approval of American Rescue Plan Act allocation within the Crime Prevention Neighborhood Enhancement Category for Neighborhood Association support for $150,000. I see uh, Assistant Director Cheryl Rainier Wig. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm not sure how you, you expect me to go through this. I can just briefly run through with this. Let me just back up. The next four are all neighborhood based ARPA requests. With me, I have Will Peters and Noel Halverson, um, and I think Kelly Armstrong is here as well, who worked with us on one of these requests. But this first one is a, a, a request in partnership with Green Bay Neighborhoods, which is our nonprofit that supports all of the neighborhood associations, along with staff. And what we'd like to do is fund neighborhood associations $50,000 each year for the next three years. That's the $150,000. The components of that annual makeup would go to um, competitive mini grants. We'd have 15,000 for that. We'd have 20,000 for operating grants. Um, we have, we'd like to set up a creation of a city hall academy. I know Bellevue does it, Appleton does it, but I think we thought it would be a good idea to get people works, right? From departments or budgets. So we have some money in there for that. I met with the chief of police, who's very interested in engaging our neighborhood associations on some crime prevention initiatives. Dollars, and that's for an undefined program yet for crime prevention. He's got some creative ideas on how to get people more activated in neighborhoods to help with um, whether it's loud cars or some other things. He'd like to work directly with neighborhood associations. <clears throat> And then we'd also like to do some, asset, some neighborhood asset building, which is basically finding out the assets you have in the neighborhood. Who lives in your neighborhood? What do they have to offer? How can we get them engaged in the boards, diversify our boards and get more people involved? Uh, what I have, and I'm open for questions. Yeah, and you know, Cheryl, one of the advantages of inviting alders to the Green Bay Neighborhoods meetings is that we know what's going on. Uh, and, and, and of course, I'm on my neighborhood association board, and I just recognize the value and impact uh, that a lot, a lot of the have in our community. Others <laughs> to the Green Bay Neighborhoods meeting uh, is is uh, I, I've noticed that fundraising um, for this fund has really lagged behind what we've done in previous years. Uh, the one thing that I want to be sure is that we're not replacing what has always been raised in the past. I would be much more comfortable with this if we're supplementing what's, what's been raised in the past. Could you speak to that? Or if we need to open the floor, um, just, just let me know and I'd make that motion. I would say we are supplementing because we are actually right now compiling and updating a fundraising cap. And so you're right in that it has been a lot more difficult to raise money for neighborhoods. You know, we're competing with a lot of other things and sometimes these quality of life issues are difficult to raise money for but we have been successful in doing that and we plan to continue to do that this is supplementing the programs that we have now okay and i know i know that program um you know was was recently contracted out to uh neighbor works and so when when i mean in the past i guess who was responsible for raising that funding and i guess uh, what's the strategy? And, and again, if Noel should be the one to answer, just let me know. But what's the strategy for, um, you know, how we're going to continue to to raise that funding moving forward? Well, in the past, it's always been city staff and neighborhood association reps and members of the GBN board that have worked collaboratively to raise money. So it hasn't just been a city staff type of thing. It's actually been a, a campaign cabinet that has worked to raise money. So we've got that cap that cabinet built again that we're working on. Um, and again, start. we're gonna go out, we've done some fundraising, we haven't been successful. It's, it's in the last couple of years, it's been dif difficult, but over, I think since 1999, we've been able to raise over a million dollars for neighborhoods, which is really good. It's just, it's slowed down a little bit recently. 
but that money will still be there. So when this ARPA money is gone, we still will have funding for neighborhood associations to support associations. Okay. Go ahead, Alder Burnett. Yeah, Ms. Rainier-Wig, I guess I'm confused on that. My concern would be that if people who would otherwise donate to neighborhood associations catch wind that the city is using ARPA funds up of $150,000, I think that they'd be less inclined to donate to neighborhood associations. That's where I'm kind of drawing a disconnect from what you're saying. You're saying that despite us allocating that money, that there will still be a robust fundraising initiative, that it won't hurt the ability to raise money? You know, we've had that discussion in the past because I've always sat on that cabinet. And as a city person, we've always said, well, the city should, I've actually heard the city should be paying for these neighborhood associations. We've heard that in fundraising asks. But I think if people are dedicated to neighborhoods, you know, we have a solid list of some donors that I'm hoping to go to that are going to look at that, this donation, if you decide to give it as a plus, that the city is supporting associations. So I'm hoping that they will add the money to that. So the, you had mentioned the last few years, there has been a drop off. Would you say since COVID or before COVID? Well, we started the campaign right before COVID hit. So that, of course, that slowed us down for making the asks. I think we were able to raise and will. How much were we able to raise, I think, on this last fundraiser? It wasn't, I think we wanted to raise. No, it was, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was over $150,000. Um, that was was raised, and you know your question about the, the pandemic. It was really difficult, right? Because a lot of the the money that was out there flowing was going towards you know uh, first responders, you know, or nonprofits that were meeting basic needs of, of of residents and individuals. So when you have organizations that are more about the quality of life, um, you know, aspect of it, where we weren't providing, for example, uh, medical supplies or 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 medical assistance, you know, it, it was very difficult for organizations like ours um, or like the Green Bay neighborhoods um, to raise funds during the pandemic. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Okay. Chairman, while I still have the floor, uh, go ahead, Cheryl, and I just have one more question. Okay, our goal was 300,000. That's generally been our goal for each campaign. So we are only able to raise half of that, unfortunately. Okay, in the uh, project summary, it states <clears throat> that in the last line that one of the purposes of the funds, one of the intended outcomes would be in the neighborhood and support residents who are struggling with COVID fatigue. That last sentence, what does that mean exactly? Is our neighborhood so helping people through COVID, I, that I'm struggling with understanding. So neighborhood associations, the fact that they're even holding events virtually or in person, they're getting people out of their houses, they're, you know, activating folks who maybe have been time. So uh, I think a lot of associations are cognizant of the fact that people are struggling with that loneliness or not being able to get out. So they're trying to gear their programs and events to get people out in outside events more so than inside events. All right. Alder Galvin. Uh, Cheryl, in years past, um, so there's been grants given out to neighborhood associations for years, and, and I don't think that money all came from fundraising or from the levy. Uh, weren't, weren't some of those other dollars coming from the, the federal or state government? No. The only money that's ever come to the GBN from the levy would be the mini grant program that is in operation maybe the last otherwise it's all it's all been privately fundraised dollars. It's all been fundraised. Yep. Okay. Thank you. There's been any ISIS neighborhood associations to form them or to assist them. Will did that as well in a small capacity as far as our city jobs. Um, but otherwise the staff person that worked for neighborhoods was funded through the GBN, even though they used to work in city hall. That was entirely funded with private dollars. All right, thank you. Noel, did you have anything that you wanted to add? If so, we can open the floor. You're good? Okay. 
Any further discussion? Motion to approve. A second. We have a motion by Galvin, a second by Hutchison. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Item seven for consideration, the possible action on the approval of American Rescue Plan Act allocation within the affordable housing development small business support category for energy efficient grants for $500,000. Uh, Cheryl, is this you as well? Yes. All right, so the city of Green Bay has operated a home improvement loan program for many, many years. In fact, that's the job I started with, with the city was giving home improvement loans. It's a great program. It's an interest-free loan. You pay it back when you sell and move. The problem recently, like currently with our program is that that dollar has gotten hard to stretch with our rehab loan programs. So what we'd like to do with some ARPA money is we'd like to subsidize or give a grant rider to the applicants of these loans, these home improvement loans. So if you get a home improvement loan from the city, you can get this extra up to $10,000 grant on top of that. that will help you pay for things that will make it less expensive for you to live there, energy-wise, furnaces, insulation, windows, things that will help you save money moving forward. So the program would be up. right now, the program is under contract. Um, NeighborWorks Green Bay was the bidder on that, and they operate that home improvement loan program. This would basically give those homeowners some extra cash to use to make their rehab money go further. The ask is for $500,000. Um, we have a waiting list of over 100 people. We're probably three years out on our home improvement loan program. So this money over the, over the next three years would assist um, over 50 um, of our applicants for the rehab loan program. Just to clarify, Cheryl, are these, uh, these are grants though, right? Whereas the home improvement loan is a low interest loan? Correct. It's a, it's a zero interest loan. You pay it back when you sell or you move. Right. Now, now this would be different though, right? Because it would have to be used within that three year window. Correct. This would be a, this would be an additional grant. We give those loan recipients to do those energy, um, portions of their rehab project. So is it exclusively reserved then for folks that would qualify for the home loans that where they could add it on or can it be treated separately? Meaning if they just wanna upgrade their furnace, for example, can they do that without having to take out a home loan? So the intent of the, our intent on this was to give additional money to the folks receiving a loan. It was not going to be a separate program, but I'd like you to, if you could open the floor for Noel to speak to that. I, I'm not sure if that's capacity, if NeighborWorks could do that, if people were just interested in doing a furnace, okay. getting a grant or, or something to that effect, but. Sure, well, I'll, I'll move to open the floor. Okay. I'll second. Uh, so we got a motion by Johnson, second by Burnett. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed motion carries. Noel Halverson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of uh, the committee. Uh, yeah, so so we have a, an extensive waiting list for this program currently, um, and uh, and so one of the things that we'll be doing is processing those existing that existing wait list prior to taking, say, a new application that might be specifically looking for access to these grant dollars. So, if um, you know, a client is going to be looking at, um, you know, uh, borrowing under this program and it happened that, um, you know, the extent of the need at that property for this low income homeowner um, could be covered just by the grant. I could see the possibility that we might make the grant instead. However, um, we've recently increased the maximum loan amount uh, of $7,500 in part because the the list is uh, of, of needs uh, for some of these homeowners are pretty extensive um, and uh, and the as as we all know costs uh, for for building and rehab have just gone up so high so that you know if somebody's facing a handful of challenges and in some cases the federal dollars that are in this loan program also require other things to be brought into compliance with code along with the the the, the identified work um you know so so we could be facing somebody who's got sixty thousand dollars worth of of home improvement need 
and a maximum loan of 37.5. And so there's typically a lot of value engineering that goes on and, and other work to try and make it possible for them to benefit from the program. And in this case, this grant program in addition will allow us to look at, oh, that's energy related or that's energy related. We'll apply up to $10,000 of grant funding borrowing and perhaps get them uh, qualified under the current program constraints. Any chance, Noel, that, that if it's paired with some of the grant dollars that perhaps we could reduce the amount that we're issuing on the home loans so that we could create more capacity there? Uh, well, uh, technically not more capacity by volume, but more capacity in terms of users, right? Because we do have that wait list. I know I was working with a resident in my district that she got wait listed in her basement's flooding and she can't afford a, a typical loan, right? So I, I would love to see access to more residents. Is that possible? Absolutely. Uh, I think there's quite a few of the elements, you know, certainly this wouldn't, this grant wouldn't apply if somebody's bathroom was, you know, co collapsing or the floor was rotting out or, or the kitchen, you know, was, was, was falling apart, but a hole in the roof that's letting water penetrate the building, you know, maybe the roof is something that is replaced with this grant as opposed to with borrowing. Uh, and because a lot of these homeowners are already, you know, struggling in terms of their their loans to value, um, this this could incre this could by decreasing the amount they have to borrow, um, uh, get the job done as well as um, make more funds available to other borrowers in the community. Yeah, and I think that that would be my main request uh, of you and your organization is, you know, working with folks in a strategic way on the deployment of these assets because there's nothing that just makes me sit more uneasy than, oh my gosh, there's a year left in this program. We need to spend through this money quick, find a way to spend it, you know? And, and so if we can be really um, conscious of that upfront to say, hey, instead of doing a loan on the roof, let's do a grant and let's, you know, free up access on the home loan to give to another resident who's in need, I think that would be an ideal scenario. Absolutely, and our staff, um, you know, do a complete home inspection and 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 look at this property and triage it, and we may involve our counselors in terms of you know financial uh, coaching or other you know conversation about the sustainability of home ownership and and other fa factors here. So this is a multi pronged approach for us in terms of making sure not only do we address those deficiencies in the home, but we're setting up that household for sustainable home ownership for the long haul uh, once they get past this current crisis with the with the repairs that are. Great. Alders, any other questions for Mr. Halverson? Um, just a quick question. What are the uh, is there a reporting feature of this? Um, like, will we be apprised in a year what the status is of the 500,000 or is it just let it go? Yeah, so I, I would I would imagine that Cheryl will devise a very capable and, and, and comprehensive reporting program for me. Um, uh, we currently work very closely with city staff on this. Um, in fact, in terms of the draws on the loan program itself, those are actually drawn um, live from the city. Uh, uh, those dollars are, are billed from contractors. And, uh, and, and so um, uh, there's a very clear awareness by city staff at any given point where the program is. Uh, okay. I will have the grants running in a similar fashion. Much like the ARPA funds, our federal dollars need to be spent as well. So we make sure that those loans are going out the door. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Anyone else from the public that wishes to speak? Seeing none, I entertain a motion to close the floor. So moved. Second. I believe we have a motion by Hutchison, a second by Galvin. Is there any discussion? On the on closing the floor, no. Any discussion on closing the floor? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Alder Burnett, on the yeah, item. Thank you. Yeah, on the item, the, the question I really have, I mean, it's more of a philosophical <clears throat> perspective, but with the ARPA funds, <clears throat> for the amount of dollars that we'll allocate, what's the most uh, people that could benefit from a program? Now, this one, uh, uh, Mr. Halvinson made a good point that perhaps some of the grants could be a lower dollar amount and that it could be more, but it is possible that 
you know, 50 property owners, 50 families or individuals could do $10,000, technically half a million dollars to benefit 50 families as compared to other things that those dollars could be used for. And I know we had discussed this at different times. I don't think that the program's bad. I think it's uh, worthwhile, but for the amount of dollars we're investing into this particular thing versus the number of people benefiting, I'm gonna have to vote no on this one, but no disrespect intended to anyone who brought this forward. Alder Galvin? Um, you know, I, I can change my vote if Jesse or Alder Burnett could tell me what he thinks we should be spending this money on otherwise. Well, it would benefit more citizens of the city. Yeah, I mean, we, we had discussed different projects and initiatives. We, we talked about some fire department things. We're, we're not quite sure how we're gonna allocate all the dollars for uh, police services. I'm not saying it's a bad program, Alder Galvin. I'm just saying that you know energy efficiency as compared to some of the other pressing needs, I'm not quite sure we could connect this towards uh, at least I can't, that this is connected to COVID in any way whatsoever. Now it could be, I mean, it could be that some family members or property owners haven't been able to invest in their properties. I haven't been able to invest in my property either. Uh, I just wish that it was a little more targeted. I could change my mind. I mean, I, I don't have that answer, Alder Calvin. We have discussed right. a lot of different initiatives. Some are more worthwhile than others. I voted for some, I voted for some uh, against some, so I don't. I don't have an answer specifically for you. Oh, yeah. I, I thought you had something more specific. All right, no, thank you. Not at the moment. Yeah, and I think you know I'd piggyback on that a little bit uh, to Alder Burnett's point, and it's a conversation, admittedly, I've had with a few alders, and it's related more to the process of how some of this is coming forward. Um, it, you know, a little bit haphazard in the sense that oh, here's, here's a month later, here's a proposal versus sort of a holistic look on what are the initiatives we're advancing and what are the ideas that are out there collectively and maybe what are the ideas that are being left behind and never being brought to our attention. So, you know, and I think that's perhaps maybe contributing to some of the concern that's developing around a number of these proposals. So it's kind of unrelated to the item, more of a, an umbrella um, comment. Um, and I think we're probably gonna see that discussion at council a little bit is, is my hunch. Obviously, we got to get through this meeting and, and make these recommendations to council, but might be something worthwhile for staff to consider and maybe prepare for prior to that council meeting. Alder Burnett? Yeah, uh, just real quick, and I'm not trying to get deep into this discussion, but I am concerned about flooding. I'm concerned about flooding in some of the areas of our city where we are historically high uh, flood damage. So if we could you know, benefit 50 families at 10,000 or perhaps purchase some properties and tear them down and prevent flooding in that particular homeowner. That's an idea. I'm not, again, just saying that that was one possible use of ARPA that, that I get behind. Yeah. And I think really it boils down to the fact that we're not being given options to choose from. It's just, here's a, right, here's a proposal. Tell me yes or no. You know, by contrast, I know the county's doing it a little bit differently you know, where here's sort of a buffet of options, tell us what you want to fund. It's just a diff different right or wrong, but I think it is creating or, you know, kind of forcing some discussion, um, you know, around what's being left at the table. So Alder Galvin, I think you had your hand up again. Yeah, I guess uh, I would direct this question to uh, uh, Cheryl Rainier Wig. If there are some homeowners whose homes have been damaged uh, in the past by flooding, would they be able to apply for grants and or loans? Uh, several of my constituents have had to raise their homes higher uh, to get above the floodplain. Would this be something where they could apply for uh, these monies? Those are eligible costs for the Home Improvement Loan Program, so they could make an application. Okay, so but if we- Basement if, or to raise that up. So we do approve this. How do we go about notifying people out there that these funds are available? I mean, you know, we could say it's for uh, energy efficiency, but how do we, you know, do we go through the neighborhood associations? Do we do a, a mass mailing to the areas that are affected to say, hey, this is this is coming up. You know, so if you're if you're thinking about uh, doing something like this, you know, you need to apply by X date and you know that kind of thing. So we have a. We probably have a two-year waiting list right now for the program. 
So we already have a pool of probably people that would be eligible for this money. Um, you know, and, and I think these comments are really good because you're right, this flooding is, a, is an issue for Green Bay. When we looked at programs, I mean, one of the main concerns we knew was we needed to get the money out the door. So, you know, these are, are ways for us to assist a lot of people and get the money out the door. I mean, that doesn't say that we couldn't come up with a program specifically for um, properties that have been damaged due to flooding. I mean, 500,000 is gonna buy maybe five houses. So, uh, you know, it depends, do you wanna repair them where they are or, um, certainly we could have more discussion about that. Okay, thank you. Alder Burnett. Yeah, I think this is the confusion is it says very clearly under the, the title energy efficiency grants. And so a owner would be eligible for a grant of up to $10,000 to be used for energy efficiency improvements at the home, such as furnaces, water heaters, windows and doors. Now granted, some of those items could be damaged by floods, especially furnaces and hot water heaters, mm -hmm. but it doesn't say anything about flooding. Is there a possibility to she says energy efficiency. So it's hard to say that this right. you know, flooding would qualify. So can we add flood? flood uh... The flooding would qualify under the, the original loan program. The home improvement loan program, the flooding stuff, would, those would be eligible costs under that program now. Sure, so, so this, uh, this is an energy efficiency grant. So if we could, you know, let's just say hypothetically, we voted this down and said, you know, we like the idea but perhaps instead of focusing just on energy efficiency grants, we also include uh, dollars to assist homeowners directly affected by flooding. Would that be a possibility? I, I, I believe it would be. I see Noel shaking his head to administer that program. Yeah, I mean, that would, I mean, uh, uh, Chairman uh, Johnson, is there a motion on the floor? Well, it's just a motion to approve, but you can certainly amend. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to refer to staff to include language and qualifications for flood uh, damage uh, dollars to um, qualifying homeowners and property owners. Yeah, and, and actually, uh, Alder Burnett, I'm gonna walk back that comment. I don't know that there's a motion on the floor. So maybe let's first entertain a motion to approve. I'll, I'll so move. Okay. Back. So I have a motion by Hutchison, a second by Galvin, and then Burnett will, if it's okay with you, we'll treat that as an amendment. Um, and maybe one suggestion I would make is rather than, I mean, do you actually want the language to come back or do you just want to add that contingency and then trust that staff will draft the language? Um, well, yeah, I mean, we could definitely have them do that, but the issue I guess is if we approve it, well, they wouldn't know there would be no official motion directing them to make that language change. We're basically approving as is, and that's not at all what I- Well, like no, you, if, you, if you make the amendment, that's, it's, it's a contingency, so they'll have to add that. Okay. Under energy efficiency grants, though? That's the-, that's the item. Yeah, I, I, I think my understanding um, is, is that you can kind of say energy efficiency and flood mitigation. Okay. Mm -hmm or flood, yeah. flood repair damage. So is that acceptable, Alder Burnett? Yes. Okay, and then I, real quickly, I just wanna get a second on that amendment. Second. Okay, I have a second by Alder Galvin. Um, I got a few hands up, Alder Grant. Sorry, I was just curious with this energy efficiency grant, is this specifically to residents only or can it be used for city buildings and whatnot? It's for owner occupied residents in Green Bay. Private okay, property. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Chief of Staff Rivera. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I just wanted to, to remind Alders that uh, you still have the ability to uh, suggest or submit um, requests for ARPA funds. In fact, the only we've only received two requests uh, from Alders uh, since we rolled them out. Uh, last year, um, just as a reminder, we had two town halls. We had old, nearly a thousand people participate by a survey. We had people submit information, and then we, as you all, uh, graciously passed the framework. And we were instructed to provide um, elements of that framework, which is what we've been doing. And the way that these have been introduced 
are the exact same way we've done uh, since the beginning of rolling out ARPA funds. So I just want to make sure that we remind uh, folks that we really appreciate your deliberation and thoughtfulness. Every alder has the ability to submit uh, a request. You can make them as specific as you'd like. Those guidelines are available. Susan, who is on this uh, Zoom, uh, can help you walk through if there are questions. I'm happy to send that out um, after this meeting again. So just as a, like, again, a reminder, we are submitting these uh, ARPA dollars the exact same way, way we've done since the beginning. Uh, we've engaged the community for over six months to get feedback. And that we also have an opportunity for alders to provide and direct specific ARPA request on their own. And there's plenty of money left over to be able to do all those things. So I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page about the process. Obviously, uh, the this committee and the council could uh, entertain or explore other options. I think the mayor is completely open to meeting with and engaging alders. And in fact, I think uh, this council, we've met with every single alder to discuss priorities. Unfortunately, we have only received two requests of uh, that. So thank you, uh, Alder Stroyer and Alder Johnson, who are the only two alders who have submitted ARPA requests specifically. Thank you. So, so just a follow-up question to that, Ahmad, just because, uh, I, I, again, I want to understand, right? Because I know staff has quite a um, quite a pile of requests, right? That that are perhaps housed right now with with your office. I mean, if we submit a request, does it automatically go in the agenda? And and, the, and this is where I think maybe the confusion is because then it kind of turns into a rat race, right? Who who can submit their request the fastest to get an up and up or down vote from this committee and council versus maybe what's the most thoughtful request that addresses the most immediate needs? So could you maybe help provide some clarity on that? Uh, yep. So we are, as you know, discussing internal projects and working with community partners on those kind of projects to bring for your consideration. Uh, we, like I said, we received two proposals uh, between from the alders. Um, we are currently discussing those proposals to see if there are either other avenues or other funding that already exists that would cover them. If there is not uh, already an existing bucket, there isn't some other dynamic that can make sure this thing can be addressed then we obviously are just gonna move that forward as written to make, as long as it uh, falls in compliance with the various ele elements of the federal law. We see no reason why there should be a barrier. Uh, we have gotten uh, a variety of requests. Many of those requests are actually outside the scope of that and we've informed people for that. I mean, you, you already had a robust conversation about roads over these ARPA funds, not the infrastructure dollars. So you've already had that conversation. Many of these conversations you all have explored already, uh, but we've actually re uh, received very few uh, requests uh, from elected bodies and the ones that do fit, we've tried to work with community leaders and community organizations and other institutions to figure out a, a way for that to be presented to you for your consideration. So uh, we consider every proposal, there is no rat race. We've uh, tried to integrate and reflect everyone that comes before us. If there isn't another avenue and this it fits into the criteria, we obviously will bring that for your proposal as long as the city can figure out a way to either implement it or put someone in charge of it or whether we're the ones who are gonna run it. And we leave that and talk to the directors about that. So I think that's probably the best recap, but we're always happy to entertain conversations and, and, and everyone, if they would like to meet with the mayor to discuss any proposal from individuals and residents to elected officials, we'd be happy to do that. So in this case, we you had mentioned that uh, Alder Stoyer, and obviously I've got the one that have submitted requests. I guess who makes the determination then about when and if that falls on a finance agenda? Uh, we are just exploring uh, whether or not one, it meets the criteria, and two, if there's not already a financial bucket. I imagine that any proposal that meets the basic criteria for it could come forward for approval. So basically then the two proposals, that, again, that have come from Alder Store and myself do not meet the requirements? Nope, um, I think that they they may. Uh, in the case of uh, Alder Store, I think we're currently figuring out if there was not already money allocated to the bid districts. We're trying to figure out if there is a particular mechanism for that, the best mechanism for that, so that we can turn it into a program. And in the case of you, Alder Johnson, I think we're just exploring uh, whether or not Disney uh, ARPA fund, or should it be a city ARPA fund, given that the other uh, people who run the Neville Museum are actually the county, even though it's placed obviously in Green Bay. And we're just having an active conversation with them to figure out what is the best bucket for this, given the, the way that that's managed. So in both of those cases, we're just triggering out the mechanism. And as soon as we figure out a, an appropriate mechanism, that would be before finance committee. Okay, I appreciate it. Um, Alder Stoyer. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Chair. Um, 
Ahmad, could, could you refresh, you know, Alder Johnson and I applied, but I, could you refresh for the committee, just explain those two uh, proposals that uh, we both brought forward to the committee, for the committee? Um, what I could probably do that would be better is I'm happy to have the, the sent to the chair and have you all do it so that's in your own words. I wouldn't want to speak uh, poorly well, about them. I, I just don't I want to some refreshing. I just don't want to mischaracterize any of the proposals, but we're happy to uh, share them with the committee or well, and, like share with yeah, and I think here's where I'd like to go with it. I don't want to get too far down a rabbit hole here with proposals that aren't on the yeah, okay. no, no action can be taken on those items tonight anyway. So no, I, I wasn't looking so for that. you and I and, and I'm guilty a little bit there too, but Alder Sir, you and I can maybe connect with staff outside of that. Um, okay. Alder Burnett. All right. Yeah, this is connected obviously to the motion that I made, but Mr. Rivera, you said that ideas would be brought forward as they come to you. I mean, you represent the mayor's office here. We had about $3 million in climate resiliency set aside for ARPA. Are you saying that would the mayor's office be open to allocating you know, a few million dollars to purchasing properties along East River? That would be a use of ARPA funds that I think would do a great deal for the city. Uh, like I said, Alder, I think that if you are interested in putting that forward, that there's a form to fill out and that all things that are being put forward are open for consideration. So there is a form for you to fill out that was sent to you um, again. If you would like to submit that as a proposal, I, I think you should, that is within your power to submit that as a proposal. How that gets negotiated and figured out, I imagine that's part of the democratic process of folks uh, having conversations with staff, feasibility, whether or not this is the best thing. You you all are a body that allocates funds. So uh, we have yet to see a proposal from you or anyone else out requesting that, but feel free to, uh, if that is what you think it needs to, you would like to have that up for consideration or requested, the, the form is completely available for your use. Right, okay, uh, fair enough. I don't obviously represent that area, so I have no strong stake other than the fact that it affects the Green Bay resident. So having said that, we're gonna spend half a million dollars of ARPA for this initiative. Maybe we ought to give it a little more thought and put a agenda item out there to possibly purchase homes uh, for those folks along the East River or Fox River affected by seasonal and stormwater flooding. So that, that changes the ball game a little bit here. Uh, according to what Mr. Rivera just said. Uh, I, I did not propose anything, but it makes me question how much uh, half a million dollars could go towards some of the other initiatives, perhaps. So. Okay, well, I think, you know, to me, it kind of signals perhaps to Alder Galvin that there's maybe a little bit of work and opportunity there prior to our next council meeting, you know, depending on the outcome of today's vote, but uh, obviously any Alder could act on that, but I presume the intent was that since the issues Related to flooding or in Alder Galvin's district, there's there's an opportunity there. Um, all right, I see Alder Eck has her hand raised. Uh, just a quick question. Can I request um, that maybe that information gets sent out to all of, uh, well, particularly the new Alders? Could you be more specific about of? which information? Oh, on requesting the ARPA funds. Yep. The, uh, the, um, uh, um, Mr. is talking about? Yep, he's shaking his head yes, so he, uh, he'll send that out. Thank you. Okay, uh, is there any other discussion? If not, we're on the amendment right now, and the amendment is to add flooding into this. Uh, so that's okay. energy efficiency and flooding grants. I guess I've got a, a point. Um, I see this standing alone. Energy efficiency, I think, is a big enough topic for me that it be applied to people who are in effect affecting their homes if it's 50 or 100 i think it that the energy efficiency aspect of it will last beyond the three years it'll continue as those things are being used i think throwing flood in here just kind of muddies the water metaphorically um i think there's opportunities for flood i think it's very important issue we have to to go, but I don't think taking money or taking this item and mixing it with flooding is necessarily efficient. That's my point. So I'm against the amendment. Okay, any other discussion? All right, so again, we're, we're gonna conduct a vote here, but it's on the amendment only. So the amendment to add flooding. 
into this. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. That's 2-2, two, two. motion fails for a majority. We're back to the original motion, which is to approve the item as presented. Is there any further discussion? Move to approve. So Second. there's already a motion on the floor. Oh. Uh, yep, so just be if there's any discussion. All right, seeing none of those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Uh, and and I, I, I was an eye on that as well. So motion carries three to one. Item number eight, for consideration, oh, I scrolled too fast here. Uh, for consideration with possible action, the approval of American Rescue Plan Act allocation within the affordable housing development and small business support category for curb appeal program for $300,000. Staff. And if I could just add one thing, Alder Brunette, uh, we'd be happy to take a look at some flood money and issues and that type of thing. I think that's important. And as our department, we could take a look at that because we, we have all that info, what houses are affected and that type of stuff. So for the uh, ARPA, with the ARPA funds, you mean? Yeah. If that's okay. what you'd like to fund with. I can, we can do some, in, we can do some research on it, I guess, to find out how many houses are affected, right? I think all, we've been working with Alder Galvin on establishing what houses are actually in the floodplain and those types of things. So we can do some research on that. All right, curb repeal. <laughs> this is a program that we've been able to run for a number of years, but unfortunately, uh, 437, our neighborhood enhancement fund, is um, we're no longer funding that program anymore. Curb appeal is a, is a grant program that allows owners to make exterior improvements to their property, like driveways, landscaping, painting, trim, those kind of small things that can make a neighborhood look not so great. It's really the, if you're familiar with the broken windows theory of things, right? You, you fix that one window and then everybody fixes the windows. So that's the whole concept behind the curb appeal program. So um, this is for property owners to make exterior home improvements. The grant is $7,500 um, to, co to cover those costs. Historically, the average grant's about $4,000. It's kind of a reimbursement. They come up with the money, then we reimburse when it's completed. We've done 29 of those grants in the past. With this uh, funding source of $100,000 for the next $100,000 each year for the next three years, um, 75 properties roughly would be able to be improved on the exterior. We would only operate within the census tract areas and it'd be administered by our staff internally. Is there a match requirement? There was a match requirement on the original curb appeal program. It was a twenty-five seventy-five, um, but I think in efforts to get the money out the door, um, we just made it into the seventy-five hundred dollar grant. Could add the match back in if you wanted us to. Yeah, I, I, there's. I think there's got to be some skin in the game. I, I yeah. don't think we should just be shelling out money to anybody who just signs up first. Um, you know, I think. Can you can you maybe give us some some overview on the uh, I know there was a curb appeal program that was introduced with the shipyard um, with, the, with the neighborhood reinvestment strategy, which is oftentimes confused with just the shipyard site itself. Those are two separate initiatives. Um, but could you tell us again what the match requirement was in that program? Well, that was the 25, 25, 75%. Okay. 2,500. So they what was the 25%. What was the cap on that program? It was $7,500. I think, well, I take that back. Will, I think it was a little higher, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a little higher. Uh, 8,500, I believe, is was the, the max. There was uh, three categories that homeowners could apply for. Um, you know, there was landscaping portion. Um, there was a portion that would cover concrete, so sidewalk and driveway. Um, and then there was, I believe, uh, maintenance. Um, Look what I found on my desk. <laughs> Look at that. That has all the details in there of that Caroon Peel program. Um, so there was a cap for each category. See, people make fun of me for having a messy desk, but when you have a messy desk, everything's right where you need it. <laughs> That's right. And that was a very successful, the, the, the shipyard district was the pilot area uh, neighborhood for that program. Um, it was uh, very successful. 
um, in in creating an impact. And in fact, uh, we really received a number of phone calls from even outside of the area. The word spread fast of uh, the existence of that program because really that's a program that isn't covered by uh, any other uh, program that we have as a city or as other uh, service provider nonprofit has in the community. Um, but it's one that can really make you know visually a pretty great impact because um, you know in our discovery walking through that neighborhood um, it was a really great neighborhood and much of what was needed is that extra touch of you know fresh coat of paints um, fresh landscaping um, you know driveway put in fresh concrete um, that really does uh, boost the curb appeal um, to put it quite literally and, and frankly and, and in, it, in turn it inspired other neighbors you know to take a little bit more pride in, in ownership in their property. So again, going back to the broken windows um, concept. So, so just for the benefit of the committee, as I'm looking over this, this again, this was shipyard, not necessarily the way this one has to land. I'll leave that up for debate, but landscaping was a max of $1,000. Exterior structural, structural rehabilitation was 2,500 max grant. Site improvement was $5,000. And I, could, could people combine those? Because it says here that you could have a, a grant will reimburse up to 75% of eligible project costs. So if you're 7,500 max eligibility, I assume that meant you could combine stuff, right? Yeah, uh, homeowners would apply for, in some cases, all three categories to maximize the benefit of the program. Okay, uh, there are questions from other alders? Well, Alder Galvin? Um, not, not really a, a question, but just a comment. I, I, I like the idea of, of the homeowners having some skin in the game. Um, you know, I understand that uh, there's some people are hurting out there. Uh, they've been hurting for years and, and we see some of those properties and I've had some of those constituents reach out to me in the past. And I'm happy that we do have some programs in place and I think this one will definitely help out, but I would like to see that, that they do have something in it. Uh, just you know, like, like you said, there's pride and ownership, so. Um, I, I, I back that. Yeah, I think, you know, unless there's any other discussions or thoughts, I mean, I, I would like to see this mirror what we did with the shipyard. I mean, if from, from what I'm hearing from staff, that was a successful program. Um, I, I, I'd like to maintain what was successful rather than, um, you know, eroding at it and eroding in the sense that we make it too accessible where, um, you know, I just, I think that, I think, and I've said this from the beginning with ARPA dollars, we should be finding every way that we can to leverage the investment so that, you know, a $300,000 investment here turns into a million dollars because of private investment that, that matches it. So, um, you know, so, so that way, you know, I would offer that up as an amendment that, that we have the program mirror exactly what we did with the shipyard, which again, had that thousand, for landscaping, 2,500 for structural, 5,000 for site improvement. And then uh, it would be a, a minimum of a 25% match. So that's an amendment if there's a second. Yeah. Second. And actually I got to back up. I'm offering amendments before we even have a motion on the floor for the, for the, main, mo for the main item. So is there, is there first a motion to approve? So moved. I'll second. second it. We have a motion by Galvin, a second by Johnson. Uh, and then I would make that amendment. Uh, as I stated before, Alder Galvin seconds the amendment. That's what's on the floor right now. Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, this is a vote on the amendment only. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Uh, now we're back to the main motion as amended. Any discussion? All right, uh, those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number nine, for consideration with possible action, the approval of American Rescue Plan Act allocation within the affordable housing development, small business support category for great to be home program, $4,000. Staff? This is my last one, Anna. <laughs> Anna's getting a nice break over there. Um, and actually, I'm going to have, I'll need to have Noel help me out on this one because they administer this program. So we've actually been working with um, Kelly Armstrong at the chamber and a housing group to look at ways to incentivize people to move into the city of Green Bay. 
So right now, NeighborWorks operates a number of down payment assistance programs. But what we really wanted to do was incentivize um, our larger employers to, to get, basically put some money into a pool that could revolve that, that would assist their employees to be able to purchase properties in the city of Green Bay. So, and it's actually, I think it's on the agenda. It's actually Great Being Home is the name of the program, um, down payment assistance program. We'd, want, we'd ask for half a million over a three year timeline. And that program would be, um, the eligible buyers would be employees of the city of Green Bay, employees of um, Green Bay headquartered nonprofits and small businesses less than 25. And then it'd be eligible for the larger employees who donate into the program um, for their employees to participate. Um, the number of requirements, if you're gonna use this money, you have to go through some home buyer education uh, you have to make sure that it's a single family or a two family. It's got to be owner occupied, serving as the primary residence. If you are a buyer above 80% of median income, you would have to purchase your home in a qualified census tract. Um, so in the efforts of trying to mix our, mix income in our neighborhoods more, we'd like if you're above that 80% to be purchasing in a qualified census tract area. Um, and with that, I know Kelly is here and Noel is here. I'd like, if you could open the floor. They yeah, I would move to open the floor. Second. All right, we have a motion by Johnson, a second by Galvin. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Uh, Noel or Kelly, either of you, or anyone else for that matter, would like to speak to this item? Sure, I, I, I would um, yield the floor to to know first, and then I'm happy to make a few comments about it as necessary. Sure. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, you, as Cheryl mentioned, we do operate uh, a number of down payment assistance programs, including employer assisted homeownership programs uh, that have traditionally followed a model where um, we have uh, an employer putting up matching funds. Uh, to make a, a, a loan, a larger loan for down payment and closing costs to assist employees per, to purchase homes. And we've got a number of major employers in the area who've participated in that program for a, a long time. Um, for some of them, it started as uh, a retention tool um, to keep employees at their company from jumping to another company. Uh, they would forgive their loan after some period of time of the employee remaining a homeowner and employed with the company. However, now it's becoming uh, an attraction tool for a number of employers uh, thinking about how to get people to, to come to our community and to work at their plant uh, or work at their, you know, their, their place of employment. And, um, and so we explored some programs around the region, including um, a, a program in Wausau and, and elsewhere, and looked at um, uh, you know, a way to, to, to incentivize uh, people who, you know, who may come to the area, live and work here. And, uh, and given the constraints of some of the ARPA dollars uh, in that they can't be loaned out, we've got to grant them out. Um, that's part of why we're, we're looking at this program to add um, some potential assistance to uh, a down payment uh, loan. So somebody might be getting a no interest deferred payment second mortgage loan in addition to you know, a $5,000 grant to help uh, clear the hurdle of home ownership. Um, and as Cheryl mentioned, right, the city of Green Bay employees, uh, employees of, of companies and not-for-profits with less than 20, you know, 25 or fewer employees, those will be eligible participants in this program. And then for those larger employers, we'll be looking at creating some new partnerships along the lines of some of our existing ones, where we'll be asking them to either make a match, a matching grant uh, to their employer or a matching deferred loan that they would forgive after several more years of owner occupancy and, and uh, employment with their company um, to help leverage these uh, ARVA dollars uh, into more impact uh, and more homeowners in the community. Awesome. Thank you, Noel. So if you don't mind, um, I would just add, so my name is Kelly Armstrong, Vice President of Economic Development for the Greater Green Bay Chamber. And I appreciate a moment of your time. Uh, some of this work has come out of our um, our housing working group, 
which uh, is a, a working group of our diversity, equity, and inclusion task force. Uh, so looking at housing through a diversity lens. And uh, that's why I think you'll see that you have not only the small business component, uh, because as we're in this war for talent, businesses of all sizes are looking for people and uh, we're actually in the process of getting ready to launch a benefits survey across manufacturing. And what we'll see is just the variation of what employers are offering for benefits. And they're starting to get really creative. And this is another creative opportunity for them uh, to help retain their workers here in the Green Bay area. So um, the small business component is great because most small businesses don't have the funds or resources be able to provide uh, those types of programming and, and benefits for their employees. And what a great way to keep people in the city of Green Bay. In addition to that, you have the larger employer piece that has a matching component, which then again, as you requested, you like to see that these dollars are leveraged with private investment. So these would be private larger employers that are then leveraging and matching that $5,000 piece and giving their potential employee an option to have 10, up to $10,000 for their down payment assistance. Uh, so uh, the other thing that's really important to note about this is that as people think about housing, we always think about affordable housing, affordable housing. Well, affordable housing is what's affordable and what's affordable for me is different than what's affordable for you or you or anyone on this call. We all have different levels of what that affordable housing means. And so we're not just talking about people that are below poverty levels. We're talking about actually one of the major needs that we have in this community that we see across the region is that need for that first time home buyer. And they're not necessarily in meeting those poverty guidelines, um, but think about the young folks that are maybe in their first or second job making about $40,000 a year. Let's say you're married, there's two of you, you're not gonna qualify for any of those affordable housing pieces, um, but you also are gonna struggle to raise $10,000 for your down payment assistance, right? And uh, I, I won't even get into what the housing market looks like right now, <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, so this is a unique opportunity and certainly a way uh, to leverage the ARPA dollars with private investment and for the city to be a partner with the business community and provide an avenue uh, for employee retention. And, and these are solid paying jobs. So um, I appreciate your consideration. So it, it, two things real quickly, and I neglected to do this earlier when we opened the floor, but Noel and Kelly, could you both just state your address for the record? Uh, Noel Halverson, 2443 Deckner Avenue. Do you want my business address? Yeah, just any address is fine. Sure, two seven uh, Kelly Armstrong, two seven zero one Larson Road, Green Bay. So, so Kelly, for someone maybe who doesn't normally come to these meetings, that that is a requirement when you speak is the name and address. So, sure. So it's oh, yeah, don't, don't think it's totally weird. Off the top too. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, I do have a couple of questions, but first I'm gonna open it up to any other members of the committee that might have questions for speakers or for the folks that, that spoke to this item. Okay, then, then I'll fire away. Um, Kelly, you talked a little bit about the potential for some, some match from larger employers. Could you maybe speak to, to that a little bit about how put together is that proposal? Um, because again, I go back to the point my name is wanting to leverage investment. Mm -hmm. um, could, I'd love to, to know, I guess, if that's kind of a real tangible thing right now, or if that's still relatively nebulous. Yeah, um, I think it's it's super tangible. Um, there's actually precedent already with another program that Noel runs. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not gonna know the name of that off the top of my head, but uh, there are employers already uh, that uh, provide a level of assistance, um, but it's uh, what we'd like to do is expand that and scale that. And this is a great opportunity to do that. Um, we've had some preliminary conversations with some businesses um, and so we know there's interest and I think it's just a matter of saying, hey, these dollars are available and um, being able to offer it as a partnership. How do you feel about having a requirement in there that, and I know, I know staff's gonna shake their head no, that this can't be done, but hear me out. 
How do you feel about a requirement that says you need to stay in your home for X number of years or the grant must be repaid? And staff, before you shake your head, no. Uh, the, the point is that um, if, if you have that employer contribution that comes in, there's some shifting of dollars that can occur there. But, but my fear, right, is folks that, that come in and, um, you know, they, they get a job offer, they use the city funding, and all of a sudden they take a new job and leave the area in a couple of months or a year. And, you, you know, we kind of, that, that value doesn't really stay here locally then. So that, that's what's going through my head. So, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I would say one thing is then you have to get really nitty gritty about what's the right amount of time frame. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Is that fair to put that on someone? Um, is that a requirement? And I'm asking because I don't know the question. And some of those uh, previous proving you know, the, um, the other ones, do, do they require a certain amount of time for you to receive the, the, the curbside piece or the flood mitigation piece or any of those other pieces? Um, I, I don't know, that's- well, The difference that's is those, that's value decision. that stays behind with the property. Yes, well, somebody buying a house and owning it and being owner occupied in the city of Green Bay, whether they're there for a year or five years is still providing value except that they take that down payment money then sell the house and that down payment leaves the community so it's no different than then you get a signing bonus right a lot of times signing bonuses you have to you have to stay on the payroll for a certain amount of time sure so. and the employers might have a requirement in there as well um, for the ones that are contributing but Knowles certainly probably has more insight on that. Yeah, and I know why staff is shaking their head. No, because ARPA's got to get out the door and I get that, but that's the transfer of employer match. So I no. actually saw Cheryl shaking her head yes, so I'm not sure. Oh, maybe maybe we looked at different times. <laughs> no, I'll go no. ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, obviously whenever a community uses some of its scarce resources to incentivize home ownership, in the form of down payment and closing cost assistance or any other thing that gives an kind of an equity bump uh, right off the bat for somebody who's purchasing. We, we, we look at those and we wonder if somebody's going to, going to sell too quickly and, and take that, that, that support and, 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 and move away. Um, and, uh, and we'll have, you know, quote, wasted our, our, that investment. I think the, 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 you know, the history that we see, um, and we've helped thousands of families in Green Bay purchase homes over the years. They're not making that jump. But buyers generally are doing this you know, maybe once or twice in their lives. Um, this is a very serious transaction, the purchase of a home. Um, the program will require pre-purchase education and counseling. We're an agency that provides that. We help people get real about where they're at with their financial lives, with their budget, with their aspirations, and making smart decisions is part of that. Purchasing a home and then selling it a year or two later isn't smart to do financially. There's a lot of opportunity costs that come with that home purchase that uh, isn't necessarily adding value to the home um, and is something that's gonna be recouped on sale. There's sunk costs with that transaction and they, you know, they, they may amortize over the lifetime of ownership. And so certainly it's something that's a possibility. I don't know that it's a possibility that deserves an extraordinary preparation um, or, or some, some program response at this point. I do think um, that the, the seriousness of home ownership and home purchasing for most families will keep them from making a foolish decision or, or a, a cavalier decision. And then um, we do have, when we work with some of those larger employers uh, currently, and some of the folks that we're talking to that have expressed interest in partnering on this program, they will also have uh, some strings attached to their portion of the financing that will will hurt if the employee leaves the company or sells the house you know within a period of three to five years and it may vary by employer so we do think we've got some tools in there to discourage this we also um, you know really force kind of that gut check among our clients when they're doing this to make sure that they know that you know if, if you're buying a home you better plan to be there for you know a, a number of years because there are sunk costs that you're not going to recover and even if I 
$5,000 grant may not overcome um, some of that, that, that sunk cost of, of the opportunity cost for purchasing. Okay. And it was just a question. I wanted some feedback. No, so. it's totally appropriate. It's something that we wrangle with in the industry. We did yeah, and, it, and with the ARPA dollars, you know, with, with regards to the loan, we knew that the grants were better. Best case scenario would probably be a three year forgivable type of like right. But then we thought, well, that might muck, muck things up with the, the original loan, the bank. So I guess looking at the big picture, that's why we settled where we did. Yeah, and I'm fully aware that sometimes you can spend a disproportionate amount of time chasing down one isolated incident. So I'm not looking to create a policy, right, that, that does that either. Um, okay, our, I, I do have a couple of comments that I'll wait, but are there any other questions? Anyone else from the public that wishes to speak? If not, I would entertain a motion to close the floor. So moved. Second. Uh, we have a motion by Galvin, second by Hutchison. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Uh, committee, any comments, feedback? Galvin? Yeah, uh, on the when I was on a police department in the training division, we, we had programs, not like the loan program, but where we assisted officers with their education. And there was a pullback if they left the department within so many years. So I, I, I kind of get that. Um, you know, you think about today, if a guy had bought a house two or three years ago, what would it be worth today if he suddenly sold it? Uh, you know, of course he'd have to be spending just as much money to buy another house. But I mean, there, there, there are things that, that make you think about, you know, is this the best thing? But I, I think Noel kind of nailed it for me a little bit when he explained that there's a lot of counseling that goes on with this. Uh, there's a lot of commitment from the families. They've got jobs. I think their bosses are not just going to willy nilly loan them out, uh, you know, or, 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 or front some of that money for that home if they think they're the kind of person that's going to be bailing out on them in six months or just not showing up for work. So, um, and, and, and even as he said, this is a discussion they've had quite a few times amongst themselves so um but i also understand your thoughts on this uh, alder johnson and, and and i agree with you on it but it, trying to find that that perfect answer um i think is 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 difficult and i think uh i'm i'm, I'm comfortable going forward with what we have right now yeah, and i would maybe just a couple of thoughts alder galvin to that point you know to me it's you know, kind of an issue that occasionally comes up is is the topic of residency requirements. And I think yeah. in this in this marketplace, I think that quite frankly is just not a good idea right now. Um, but that said, this kind of creates a nice carrot versus a stick, you know, type of type of approach where you're 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 giving an incentive to folks to want to relocate uh, within the city of Green Bay. So I think that's a really good thing um, for the city of Green Bay as an organization. Um, now it's interesting because obviously our, our housing market is really plagued by short supply right now. So, so in essence, we're just kind of shuffling the dollars around. And I don't know that unless you're buying a rental unit and taking it off the market that you're doing anything to increase home ownership percentage in the city. Um, so, you know, one thing that I'd like to see, and I don't want to handcuff this program. So more so it's just saying, Hey, Noel, Hey, Cheryl, if we could look at this, you know, I I look back at um, our new homes in your neighborhood program and, and the city owns a number of lots. I mean, to me, a better strategy is can we create a higher incentive to encourage more inventory in the marketplace by getting people to build on these lots that in some instances the city's owned for way too long, and then you get them back on the tax roll with, with the new structure as well. So you're growing inventory, you're adding to the tax base, um, and in the case of like maybe some some really old rental units, we used to have that conversion grant program, um, you know, taking a look at units that have been converted to rental units that really shouldn't be rental units, right? They're not appropriate living conditions, um, I, you know, and, and I think if, if we can maybe kind of, you know, I don't want to piggyback it on this, but certainly those are things that could be interconnected. Um, and then you know, just a general broad statement. And, and Will, I know you were part of this group. Cheryl, I can't remember if you were, but it was like Title Town something we started out as, right? Working with Title Town Transformation. Yeah, Habitat and, and Neighbor Works. And, and this was an idea that we had talked about. 
unfortunately, there just really wasn't any any funding available at the time, right? I mean, to to pursue something like this. And it ultimately morphed into the Shipyard Neighborhood Investment Strategy. So broadly speaking, these are good programs. They work elsewhere. Uh, it's, it's a market transformation that really kind of helps us find unique ways to attract talent to our community. So I, I'm broadly supportive of it, but I'd like to see some additional support come down the road for conversion grants and new homes in your neighborhood. And the last um, comment that I just, you know, more of a question than anything, any feedback from staff or even the committee members <clears throat> about folks that might use this program and the Curbabil grant program? I mean, do you see any need to separate those where if you do one, you can't do the other? Um, you know, because obviously you can create a really nice nest egg if you know about the programs. Um, just open to feedback what other folks think about that. But the point of appeal is to make those exterior improvements. If you're buying a house, more than likely you're spending your money on your down payment and your repairs you have to do. It'd be such a bad thing to add that curb appeal onto a down payment if someone chooses to do that. Um, yeah, it, to me, it just reduces the, the, again, the total number of residents that you're serving. Yep, that it would. Alder Galvin? I, I, I would have a, I would not have a problem with that because I, I know that uh, my first home purchase, it was, you know, it was all going into the house and, and getting it done. Uh, there were things I would have liked to have done outside, but it just wasn't feasible for the first few years. And uh, if we're, let's face it, we're not going to be looking at high-end houses here. We're going to be looking at houses that probably need a little TLC. And uh, if people can get a little boost with that, and, and let's face it, when you're driving down the streets, and, and I did a lot of that on my job, you, you would see neighborhoods that could literally be the block next to each other and a radical difference in the appearance of the homes and the yards. And you could feel the difference as you drove through. And, and if you're looking to buy, that, that's the kind of thing you're looking for. So I think the more we can do, the more we can expand those dollars out and, and get some of that going on, I, I don't have an issue with that. And I would say to Alder Johnson's um, comments about available lots. Cheryl, correct me if I'm wrong, but the first time I, I ran for office, I met a couple on, I think it was Chicago Street, two teachers at house school that had gotten a lot from the city for, I think a dollar. And the caveat was they had to build a home. It was an empty lot. They had to build a home that blended with the other homes surrounding it. And uh, while I was on the porch with them, they were like saying hi to 8 million kids because they both taught at the, you know, the same school and they wanted a home near that where, where they worked. And uh, I thought, wow, um, you know, it seemed like an amazing project at the time. And uh, certainly I think uh, Alder Johnson, though, his comments about some of these big old Victorian homes that have been turned into four or five units, uh, even if you would turn them into uh, uh, three floors of condos that people could purchase, and then they'd have that ownership again um, and, and then they got skin in the game. It's not just a rental unit. So technically, yeah, still multifamily, but instead of having five or six, maybe we only have two or three families in them and, and they actually have the ownership uh, as it on, which I think gets people to stick around more if they own something as opposed to renting it. Both of the programs you put in the neighborhood enhancement funds um, funded good version grants and the new homes in your neighborhood program. So are, are these things you'd like um, me to look at coming out of this pool of money or would you like me to consider a separate ARPA request for those things? Well, my, my opinion would be that um, if, if we could use ARPA for that end, I mean, let's face it, we got a lot and I think Alder Johnson even more so has a lot of these blighted rentals um, that used to be magnificent homes at one time. And if they could be turned into, like I said, maybe single family or maybe even multifamily, but not rental units, but something that people could own, um, I think that would go a long way to helping do what we've been trying to do by improving some of our neighborhoods. Um, and at the same time, if we do have some of these empty lots, I know we've been trying to get townhomes put up or apartment buildings, but again, if we could go back to just single family homes on some of these lots, uh, again, I. I, I think that's an, an enhancement to the neighborhoods. Agreed. 
Uh, Chief Staff Rivera. Uh, uh, um, Alder Johnson, I, I think these are absolutely fantastic ideas. And if you think that it would be good to put in um, a communication or uh, set up some direction, I just want to make sure that if, unless they're amending the, the actual polls, so I have really brilliant ideas that uh, the staff could work on. Um, I, I imagine the mayor would uh, fully support. Um, and so let us know if that is what you need um, to move forward or you want to put that forward uh, among this committee and we can get working on that and have it uh, prepared for you as, as quickly as possible. But I just wanted to, I wasn't sure if that was uh, uh, connected with uh, this program or the other. And uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention is, you know, the mayor is fully supportive of figuring out if there's a, a payback structure, maybe not a, a requirement uh, for how long you live here, but if you uh, move before the longevity the, uh, the thing is uh, completed or things of that nature that there might be a portion that you would pay back. So I wanted just to kind of um, say that the, the, the mayor is fully open and prepared for that and the other items, which I think are absolutely fantastic and fit into the framework that you all approved, uh, particularly about reusing uh, undeveloped plots and trying to increase the supply is something that we are trying to tackle. So if you would like to you know, give us some direction or suggest that uh, staff work on that, I think that'd be something that would be um, received with a lot of positivity. Yeah, and I, I have it written down. I'm not, I, I don't wanna handcuff this program. I, I think it can be its own standalone uh, discussion point because it's going to require uh, more funding than, you know, than, that would kind of saddle, I think, this program. So, Alder Burnett. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chairman. Question for staff, uh, the Great to Be Home program, is it required that the purchase of the property be within the qualified census tract? Only if you're above 80% of median income. So, so if you're 80%, we'd like you to purchase in the qualified census tract area. It doesn't say that in the proposal, right? I could have missed it. See, some of the other write-ups have mentioned census tract, and I just want to make sure we're being consistent. Under requirements of the program, the very last bullet um, on that program, it says for buyers above 80% of median income, purchased homes must be in the qualified census tract. On the, on the... On the memo sheet? Look on my memo. Yeah. yeah, it's it's oh, in there, Alder Burnett. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. I, I the sheet. Okay, as long as it's in there, I want I just want to make sure we're being consistent. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Is there any further discussion on this item? All right. Seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Uh, just a, a, a legal question, Attorney Bungert, and of course, if other staff wants to chime in. Um, we have one of our speakers um, has a commitment. Is it to, is it possible uh, to amend the agenda after the agenda has been approved? Would it just be a motion to reconsider? Oh, don't do that. Sorry, you had to uh, mute. Yes, we can do a motion to reconsider approving the agenda and then go back um, and then and then it'll be as if the motion ever happened. <laughs> okay, uh, committee, if you'd indulge me, I would like to I, I would move to reconsider the approval of the agenda. Second. So moved. Um, all right, I think I, I made the motion. Burnett did a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. I would move to amend the agenda to, uh, to move up um, item number 12 to where we're at right now, which is <laughs> I'm lost in the agenda. Take we're on 10. Okay, so that's where I would move it. That's an amendment. Is there a second? After, after I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kelly. Tell me where you want it. <laughs> We're gonna break rules. <laughs> I'm all about it. <laughs> Thank you. You, you wanted you twelve, right, right after ten. Yes, if you could move twelve right after ten. Twelve I after ten. That's that. my motion. Thank you. Excuse me, ma'am. You need to mute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. Okay. Uh, uh, did someone second that? I'm sorry. Sure, I'll yes. second. Okay. So there's a motion by Johnson, second by Hutchinson. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Thank you, committee, for indulging me in that. I know our speaker has a commitment she needs to leave and wants to speak to this item. So we are now going to be on item number 12 for consideration with possible action the approval of American Rescue Plan Act. 
allocation within the affordable housing development small business support category for Green Bay Area Chamber of Commerce micro business staff for one hundred and eighty thousand dollars staff. Can you give us a quick overview? Director, no, I can jump is that you? Yep, I can jump in on that one. Absolutely. This is this has been we've been working with uh, with chamber staff uh, to develop a kind of a staffing uh, resource to assist uh, minority owned businesses here in the city. Um, program is essentially um, requires it is something just simply requires manpower to get somebody out to actually do that. There are programs and resources available, but without a dedicated staff person to do that, uh, it is difficult to get those get that essentially out into the targeted audiences where they are at. Uh, this is a jointly funded program from both both uh, the city and the chamber are sharing costs in this particular position. Uh, so we do think there is considerable interest from the community and certainly would defer to Ms. Armstrong to for specific plans on on uh, what they have developed in terms of the specific program and how this position, uh, what they would actually be focused in working on. Uh, but certainly from my own perspective, this is definitely a, a need in the community uh, that, that certainly would be would benefit uh, from having a staff resource. So. Okay, uh, I'd entertain a motion to open the floor. So moved. Second. All right, we got a motion by Galvin, second by Hutchison. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Uh, Ms. Armstrong. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity and consideration. We're super excited about this opportunity to partner with the city. Uh, this position is uh, meant to serve a lot of needs, uh, but a small business, uh, essentially small business, business retention expansion, and focusing on uh, businesses owned by people of color. Uh, and, and we feel like, um, this is an ability to bring resources to folks. So one of the things that we see in the marketplace is we have uh, a lot of business resources and partners and relationships that we've built obviously with the city as well, but the SBDC score, all of these other businesses and resources are here. A lot of them are uh, free services that are available and as much marketing as you could do, um, it's not as good as having someone going door to door, knocking and meeting with these businesses, building the relationships um, and helping them understand what resources are available. That would include any additional grants uh, that the city offers, but also just bringing the resources that are already available uh, to the businesses, as small businesses that are in uh, the, the city of Green Bay. So uh, we're excited about this opportunity. It would be one designated person uh, that would be out building these relationships and uh, just seeing the growth. Uh, obviously, you all have seen the census numbers and growth in um, <laughs> our populations of color and making sure that we're serving all of the businesses in our community is of vital importance. And so I appreciate you, the opportunity for you to consider this position and happy to answer any questions. Kelly, just one, I have one question for you as a former chamber employee. Um, obviously, I, I'm very familiar with how chambers work, and oftentimes they are membership required uh, organizations. Um, if will will chamber membership be required for individuals to access this programming? No, it will not. Um, so we're going to treat this just like we do our business retention expansion, which right now currently focuses on industrial manufacturing only, um, and that is independent of chamber membership. We meet with over 160 businesses a year uh, and connect them to resources, help link them um, to whatever is needed by that business, this would be the same operation. So it is agnostic of membership uh, and it is solely focused on small businesses and uh, just meant to bring those resources to the small businesses and really empower them. Because a lot of times too, especially when you're starting a small business, you don't know where to start and it's hard to come ask for help. So technically these small businesses could come to us right now and we walk through our door but they have to walk through the door um, this gives us the opportunity in partnership with the city to be able to meet them where they're at and that's that's a huge differential and will this position operate within your department yes okay perfect any other questions alder burnett yeah thank you uh ms armstrong i, I just want to make sure that the program is entirely inclusive of everyone. I know there are some target demographics in the document, but I mean, those demographic groups could include, in my opinion, 
people who are disabled or poor, mm -hmm. homeless, blind, deaf, lower, uh, lower educated people. I just don't like, you know, the, the effort to serve marginalized populations that other perhaps marginalized populations that maybe aren't as visible perhaps that they somehow feel excluded from the program. Can you just ensure me that, that there will be complete inclusion for, for all community members who want to access this program? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we, um, I'm not sure how to articulate that, but the, um, when we look at businesses, we don't, uh, we meet with everyone. So there isn't a filter that says we can't meet with you. Um, and so I, I would just say our normal course of work in meeting with businesses is inclusive. Um, so yes, that won't be a problem. In the, in the document though, it doesn't necessarily say that. So if we're gonna allocate city dollars through ARPA, I just would hope that as the project gets a little more defined, like people who don't necessarily fit in that demographic groups that you mentioned also are aware of this program. Does that make sense? Sure, um, yeah, I mean, we, we will do our best to make sure that is the case. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Seeing none, I entertain a motion to close the floor. So moved. We have second. a motion uh, by Galvin, second by Hutchison. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Um, I like this program. Very, very interestingly, um, our organization actually wrote a grant for this program uh, to the state uh, for ARPA dollars. We were not awarded, but uh, Kelly, you'd appreciate this. I was with Lauren earlier today and uh, who works at the chamber and I was talking to her about this proposal and made the comment that the chamber is much better situated to take this on for us citywide rather than you know us trying to do it for a district. But the reason we wrote the grant is because we saw the need and, and we saw the, the businesses that we were work i mean you have a higher failure rate with businesses with people of color you have higher barriers you have and yet interestingly through the pandemic the demographic that was opening the most businesses uh were african-american women and and so to me aldi burnett i get your point and i think there is a lot of access points um for really any business right to, to programming and access to programming i think the difference to me for this though is recognizing opportunity and right now there's an opportunity that exists that isn't being very well served. And I think when you have a program that, that intentionally or strategically, I should say, tries to create more opportunity in, in, in areas that um, have barriers and let's eliminate those barriers, I think that's really what this is attempting to do. Um, so I, I do support this for a lot of reasons, but um, I, I think it's just one of those that any time that you can recognize statistically that hey, folks who open businesses, you know, have a fifty percent success rate. But if you are, um, if you are a person of color, or if you're a veteran, or if you are a female, and your success rate is forty percent, or thirty percent, or twenty percent, that's a problem, right? And that's the opportunity and the gap that I think this program can work to close because we should have everybody at that fifty percent success rate or whatever the numbers are. But you guys get. I hope you understand my point. So. All right, any further discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Oh wait, uh, sorry, we don't actually have a motion. Is there a motion to approve? Yes. I have a motion by Galvin. Second. Second by Hutchison. All right, any further discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? All right, motion carries. Um, moving on to, ten. Uh, what, is it, what are we on? Item 10, right? Yeah. Uh, for consideration of possible action and a name change to the American Rescue Plan Act allocation within the affordable housing development small business support category for the accelerator program for $40,000 approved by Common Council in February 2022. Staff? I can take that one, Mr. Chair. This is essentially, this is essentially an administrative uh, change, essentially. Uh, the program is not really being changed. It's just kind of who the chamber is utilizing to implement the program. 
Uh, they're just kind of wanting to reflect that the fact that it is not specifically tied to going forward to the blueprint program. They would, but they will continue to basically uh, operate in a, a business accelerator. They just wish to make sure that it was accurately reflecting the fact that they may, they may have a different contractor providing those services, which so staff is certainly in favor. Uh, no other changes to the program. As and if I recall, they, I mean, the blueprint was, let's call it more or less the equivalent of a franchise, right? A couple of guys out of Milwaukee. So just might look at a different partnership than to run that program. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Any discussion? A motion to approve? So moved. Motion to approve. All right. We got uh, Hutchinson with a motion, okay. Galvin with a second. Any discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. Okay, item number 11, for consideration of possible action, the approval of American Rescue Plan Act allocation within the affordable housing development small business support category for homeless homelessness blueprint staff for $90,000. Staff. Anyone from staff wanna take this one? Brian, I don't know if anyone from staff will, but. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll open say, the floor for you in a second here, Rashad. Yeah, I was gonna say, Mr. Chair, I believe I believe Mr. Cobb is actually the appropriate one to address you this. You got that. Entertain a motion to open the floor. So move. Second. All right, uh, I didn't catch that. I think it was Hutchison, Galvin. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Uh, Mr. Cobb, if you could please state your name and address for the record. Yeah, my name is Rashad J. Cobb, and my address is 1288 Hannah Street, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Thank you for your patience, sir. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to come here and speak today. And essentially, uh, what you see is, is what we're asking for is a $90,000 allocation out of the ARPA funds to help support um, a three-year position um, that will be crucial in the implementation of the housing blueprint that was created. Back in October of uh, 2020, if you can all remember that long ago, the Greater Green Bay Community Foundation in collaboration with our Brown County United Way, the city of Green Bay um, and Brown County came together and hired uh, the, uh, the Corporation for Supportive Housing to come in and help us construct a, a housing blueprint. We've got another document in the community called the Blueprint that was really designed to try to help us end or prevent issues related to uh, homelessness and housing insecurity. And so over the course of uh, about a year's time, I led a number of conversations and community listening sessions. I believe we had up to 16 community listening sessions where we had uh, service providers, uh, individuals from law enforcement, uh, hospitals, and other entities come together to talk about what are some solutions that they see for ending homelessness and housing insecurity in our community. Uh, through, through that um, experience, we were able to come up with um, five different strategies and about 90 different actions that will really uh, implement some systems levels change that will help us address that issue. Um, if individuals had an opportunity to review the blueprint, you'll see one of the most key components of that document was the recommendation that we establish a new structure in our community to support the work that needed to happen. Um, and one of the, the key elements of that structure was the, um, the hiring of a blueprint project manager. Um, and that's what the request is, um, is today. Um, we've got some other um, recommendations that came out of that particular blueprint, which was the creation of a regional council to prevent homelessness. That's already been set in place. There are also some recommendations made to our Brown County uh, Housing and Homelessness Coalition. Um, they've adopted the blueprint and, and fully support um, the actions that are contained within the blueprint. And so the last piece that we need to do is to get this project um, uh, director hired so that we can begin to coordinate some of the activities that need to happen and, and do some of the other recommendations that were put forth in the in the document. There's already some existing funds for that um, for that position too. And so that ninety thousand dollars obviously would not be to cover the entire salary. There are already dollars that were put together by some of the players I, I mentioned earlier, the foundation, um, Brown County United Way. Um, and so we're just looking for that, that $90,000 to close a shortfall over the, the three years of that, um, of that project uh, implementation director's uh, um, pose position. Shot is the county contributing? The county is contributing in ways that are not uh, financial directly. Um, in terms of they're not directly create or committing salary to 
<clears throat> the uh, the hiring of this position, but I know through some of the work that they've done with some of their ARPA dollars, they've um, added staff in certain um, departments that will directly result in uh, supporting aspects of this work. Um, th this particular document, this blueprint, talks about the coordination of services and the need for um, additional services as it relates to AODA related issues and things of that nature. And that's where the county is stepping up and we really appreciate the allocation that they made to help support the creation of, of those positions because that'll go a long way um, in helping on the county side. With some okay. of those services that they and, I, and I ask, of course, because it's no secret, I mean, this body has talked about it at nauseum about how the city seems to be absorbing, absorbing a significant brunt of the financial burden uh, for a countywide problem. And, you know, and I, I appreciate, you know, you know, that they're investing in, in other areas, but obviously when it comes to ARPA, they received more than twice what the city received. Um, I mean, they received, I think $53 million in ARPA funding, um, it, you know, so, <laughs> and again, it, it, this is a countywide problem, not just a city of Green Bay problem. And I wanna make sure that uh, in the spirit of true partnerships that, you know, they're, they're investing proportionately uh, to the scope of the financial services that are necessary to holistically address the problem. Yeah, and, and I don't have the, the numbers in front of me um, in terms of what their actual allocation was to the position that they're helping to support <clears throat> within their staff, so I couldn't speak to that. Yeah, and I, yeah, and, and I, I appreciate the insight that you were able to offer. Um, okay, uh, are there any other questions from the committee? Galvin? Um, and I read through it as much as I could find, but, uh, and obviously there's different types and levels of homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the one that's really affecting us um, because it's so obvious is the, the resistant homeless that we have. Um, people, there's, there's a group of them suffer from uh, alcohol, drug, uh, mostly brought on by mental health issues um, th these are the individuals we get a lot of complaints on. They cause a lot of disruption in our community. Uh, our park department has been, and I don't know why a park department is in charge of trying to, to try and uh, help with this problem and, you know, and, and keep it on a level where it's not blowing up on us. Uh, we're re putting police resources into it. Um, and I'm just wondering, will this individual be working with that at all? Or, or is this for, um, you know, the, the other homeless people that are actually attempting to try to be not homeless, that are working towards those goals. Yeah, thank you uh, for, for that. I, I think you made a really good point in, in noting that those are the most visible members of our community who are facing this issue. issue. But um, from a statistical standpoint, they probably make up a, a smaller percentage than individuals. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. But to directly to answer your question, I think a lot of those dollars that uh, Troy and his team have allocated towards the position that they have, are going to help to support uh, individuals who have those AODA issues and, and other issues related or similar issues. But yes, this individual um, who would come into this position would be doing a lot of work with uh, individuals at the county and, and others to try to specifically support this particular uh, subset of, of individuals. We recognize, um, as, as a community foundation, we recognize that that's when employed by the Greater Green Bay Community Foundation. We, re we recognize that there are individuals in this community who are somewhat reluctant to services, um, and I think that our service providers uh, in the nonprofit community are aware of that. Are aware of that as well, and so we do see a lot of different innovative efforts to try to connect with those individuals. But there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, you know, our blueprint was really developed um, alongside some work that happened in Rochester, um, Minnesota, and they've had success in implementing some of the programs and, and strategies that have come out of their blueprint recommendation. And so we're really hopeful that this and to do the same in our community but specifically to answer your question yes um the person who comes into this role will definitely have those individuals um on their radar as a as a group that definitely needs supports and we have to be innovative in how we go about trying to support them all right thank you very much okay any other questions for mr cobb all right are there any members of the public that wish to speak i don't think we have any others all right, entertain a motion to close the floor. So moved. So moved. Second. 
All right, we have a motion by Galvin, a second by Hutchison. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Um, Alder? First. Look, I'll, I'll, I mean, I've been, you know, relatively familiar with this program for a while now. And, and I have probably been part of a, what, I, what I feel like is a growing number of people that are concerned about the amount of resources that we're investing into an issue um, and, and at least on the surface, a ton of progress. But I also feel like this is the best way for us to see progress. And, and the foundation, the United Way, um, you know, some other partners, including the city, have really been working on this for a while. And I think that their approach with community engagement, you know, is 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 really critical. It, I, I'm not going to be one of those people that thinks zero homelessness is really an attainable goal. I think it's existed for as long as humans have existed. And um, but but we clearly have. Uh, it, it, you know, to Mr. Cobb's point, there's a visible problem out there. In fact, I'm, I'm getting just hit up with phone calls every other day uh, about whether it's encampments or, you know, whatever the issue is. So, so it, I, the one thing though that I would really want to see out of this is regular reporting, probably to our protection and policy committee. Um, you know, maybe if that that dashboard is created, if it's something that um, much like we get crime statistics every week, I'm not saying we need these statistics every week, but whatever that dashboard is, uh, it would be nice for council to to be engaged on that because we, we have to make some progress on this issue. And I think having someone who's dedicated to experienced practices that that truly solve the problem uh, I, you know, I, I'm in support of that more than I would be in, in continuing to funnel more money towards something that doesn't have uh, a stated outcome. So. Alder Galvin. I would, I would uh, piggybacking on that. Uh, I, I mean, from my experiences with my work, uh, I, I, I worked with the schools. I worked with uh, Salvation Army. Um, I'm on the board of directors for foundations and, and several of our staff do work with, with the homeless. Um, I mean, the homeless, I, I, I still think most people in Green Bay don't understand the scope of it. I mean, literally over 800 children in the public school system are considered homeless. I mean, literally thousands. Um, it makes, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we have so many different organizations and, and uh, groups that have established places for people to stay. Uh, NEW is, is highly successful. Um, and I can't think of, there's so many more for, I mean, and you break it down into all the subgroups, single mothers, um, people with children, people without children, uh, veterans. Um, but the one thing that everyone sees, and, and, and part of the problem with the homelessness is, the problem with homelessness is, you don't see them other than the individuals related to St. John's. And, and that's what everyone focuses on and Shad, you're right. They make up a very small percentage of our homelessness um, population in this county. Um, but what? So what people are always asking the alders for is: is can you, we do something positive to reduce St. John's or hanging around the downtown? And 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 like I said before, they're resistant. Um, they. For whatever reason, mostly mental health, they, they are resistant. And it's hard to get the cooperation uh, to help them off the streets where they're not going to be at risk or at, at, at least at, at risk as much as they are now. Um, so, again, uh, like Alder Johnson said, with a goal in mind, I can support something like that. So we can sense a, uh, see if we're making progress or not and then massage the program if necessary. And so I, I am in support of this as it is right now. So maybe just a comment uh, for Rashad, and you don't necessarily have to respond to it, but you know, one of the things about Green Bay that I've always observed is we are very charitable. Philanthropy is very strong here in our community, uh, particularly for basic needs. And I think as a result, it's very easy for organizations to sort of proliferate, um, it, which ultimately creates a lot of redundancy. 
if there is a way for this program to take a look at consolidate, how do we most effectively streamline our investment, you know, into these areas? I just, it's a worthwhile thing um, to consider and pursue. So just, uh, that's me on my soapbox, but. <laughs> Alder Burnett looked like you wanted to, were you raising your hand? No, okay. All right, we would entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. All right, we have a motion by Hutchison, a second by Galvin. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Um, uh, and Rashad, this goes to city council for final approval next week. Just a heads up. Okay. Um, what are we on? 13, right? 13, yeah. Okay. Request by Alder Burnett to the Finance Committee, which states to create a policy or amend an existing policy to prohibit or prevent city personnel from the offices of clerk, mayor, law, finance, and IT in soliciting, accepting, or using any donation in the form of money, grants, property, or personal services from an individual or non-governmental entity for the purpose of funding election-related expenses, voter education, voter outreach, or voter registration programs, with the exceptions of compensation of poll workers, securing leases for polling locations, and PPE for voters and volunteers. Alder Burnett, would you like to address your uh, communication? Sure. <clears throat> We were all at the meeting, obviously, so we know the discussion, the ordinance uh, cannot, <clears throat> cannot be voted on or even brought forward. So then I came up with this idea. Really, it's quite basic. I don't want the city to experience what we had experienced from the 2020 election onward. We all have our own opinions about the election, things that were done, things that we have voted on, maybe we wish we hadn't been voted on, questions that maybe we wish we would have asked at the time as things became clear. So I don't want to make this a big, you know, controversial thing. I just simply want the guardrails put in place for us to to say that right now, I mean, we should be able to run our August and November election and any election into the future with our own resources. Uh, you know, and then if we do need to apply for a grant, that it would only be for the purposes of paying poll workers, you know, Green Bay residents, preferably, or Brown County, not sure what the legal requirements are, that we can take grants to pay for leases or true uh, needs of PPE to keep poll workers and voters safe. Um, we saw quite an expansion of things that the city did with grant money. I voted for it at the time. When things became into focus, I started questioning more and more, specifically advisors being involved in our elections. So really, it's quite simple. Take the policy, the existing grant policy that we have as a policy-making body of our city government, simply put those provisions in place to assure the public that we are not going to be subjected to this sort of thing again, that despite what happened in the past, we are going to move forward and we're gonna make sure that we run our election uh, without outside influence, whether it be grant dollars, get out the vote efforts, um, uh, advisors, right down the list. So I think it's rather straightforward with those uh, preliminary comments that I just made. For clarity's sake, Alder Burnett, um, I, I think we've you know heard and talked about maybe some of the challenges with proposing as an ordinance. Is it uh, from your perspectives of what you want to see as an outcome. Is it acceptable if that uh, provision just simply be added to our grant policy? Yeah, and I think I had exchanged some emails with um, Attorney Bungert and perhaps Clerk Jeffries, and that was the idea that was put forward. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm willing to drop the, I mean, I don't know if I have a choice, quite honestly, on the ordinance if the law department says we can't do it, we can't do it. I understand that, but I do think it's a fair compromise. And really it just, it allows us to communicate to the public that as a body, we're gonna do whatever we can with our own resources to do it. So and would your, been, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I thought uh, you were done. So no, uh, a running on sentence here, but uh, yeah, the, to amend the grant policy, I think would be perfectly fine in my opinion. So would you be looking to refer this to staff to bring back or do you have the language prepared? 
Well, the uh, link, see what happened was there was a little bit of community, uh, there's a little bit of confusion. I had made the motion at the committee or at the full city council. It was kind of changed a little bit because I read it and I don't know how this came to the committee today if it was my word submitted through a resolution or a communication form or if clerk jeffries got it from the the minutes of the meeting i, I don't know yeah could we maybe go to attorney bunkert for some insight i may defer to director ellen becker um as to where it came from my understanding was i think this language was from the language that you had submitted alder burnett in your communication which I think was a little bit more, I don't think the motion captured, <clears throat> excuse me, captured everything you had stated um, on the floor. Um, so I think this this language is what you had provided in your communication, but I would defer to Director Ellen Becker if that was in fact the case, if she received that from Clerk Jeffries. Yes, that is correct. I did receive the communication probably the day after, either Wednesday or Thursday um, after the council meeting. And then we had just, putting our packet together on Thursday, we put the communication um, into our packet. And I think on Friday, I saw some emails going back and forth, whether or not it should be the motion of communication and we already had it on our packet. So I just left it in the packet. Okay, for the, for the sake of expediency, because I wanna make sure that if in fact, this is approved by council to refer this to staff, would it make the most sense maybe to, let's not, I mean, just refer it to staff, have uh, Aldrew Burnett, Attorney Bungert, work out the language as he'd like to see it and just bring it back to the next finance committee meeting because, you know, next election isn't until August. So if we do that, I mean, we still have plenty of time to get that adopted and in place, right? Uh, Aldrew Burnett, would that be okay with you? I'd be more than happy to um, work with Attorney Bungert. If you remember the first, um, when we accepted the grant dollars 2020, I believe there was probably some conversations that the mayor had been having with other mayors of other municipalities. And I, I, I obviously CTCL must have announced the, the funding possibilities to the city of Racine and then Green Bay got involved through that connection. So I guess uh, we were told at the meeting a couple weeks ago or last week that there is no plans or at least that's what Clerk Jeffries had indicated. So if this is a simple refer back to staff and if she can Somebody to tweak the policy so with me uh, and get it submitted to maybe not the city council meeting this coming um, meeting, but the one, but the problem is we don't have many in June. I don't think we have a city council meeting in June, is that correct? No, so I think procedurally what would happen is this, this would come out of committee, council would approve it. If, you know, other council or alders have additions that they would like to see as part of the language that they want to make as part of the motion, they can do that on. Tuesday, and then that officially gets approved, referred to staff, and then this could come back to committee then for approval. Um, I think the next one is the 24th of May. So we have another finance meeting um, in May, and then we have a council meeting on June 7th. <clears throat> Yeah, so I think if we can make that timing work, Attorney Bungert, for you, to yeah. me, Aldrew Burnett, to your point, mm -hmm. there are two things going on right now. One is a lot of public discussion around this issue. So I'm skeptical that there's gonna be, you know, any covert operation <laughs> to try to, to do this, you know, but the other piece of it is, of course, that all grants have to be accepted by this body anyway. So yeah. I, I, I think if, if something were to come forward that would want to use funding for the purposes that we're looking you know, to pro potentially prohibit, it's got to come before us for a vote regardless. So, so I think that there's a couple things that would, that are kind of still blocks there until this language is put in place. If the, if the full body were to support it, does that make sense? Okay. So, so unless there's further discussion, yep, go ahead, attorney Bungert. Just a little bit of clarification. It would be kind of a joint effort between law department and finance department. The reason that this initially <clears throat> came to finance is this was a policy that came from the finance department with respect to the acceptance of grant money um, and how grants are pursued and how they're brought to council. Um, so um, I, it would, it'll be a joint effort between both departments um, and, and Alder Brunette's input as well. <clears throat> Great, Alder Brunette. 
Yeah, and I showed my frustration at the city council meeting, and th that was not a fair way to imply that you would create a swerve attorney bunker, and I regret those words, but it just seems like some of these ideas that I bring forward that I think are good ideas, I just need help with staff to kind of present something in a way that the council could could vote on, because I do think it's a good idea. I stand by it. I, I don't want the city or staff or anyone to go through this again. We have learned quite a bit through the COVID process. Again, it is what it is. We know the history and whether it's fair or not, there's criticism all around and I just want to avoid that. I want a drama free election. And I think that we can put this behind us and move on. So. Okay. Would you like to make a motion, Alder Burnett? Right. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to refer to city staff, the uh, law office and the finance department to um, draft the policy revision for a vote in June of the full common council. That sound good? Sounds great. I'll second that. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 14, a request by Alder Burnett to the Finance Committee, which states, for status update and discussion regarding legal services received from Law Forward States United Democracy Center in Stafford Rosenbaum LLP with possible actions such as continuing or discontinuing legal services received, Alder Burnett. Yeah, here again is another um, situation. Um, Alderman Hutchinson, you may not be aware of the history here, but right around the time the Office of Special Counsel was created, we were approached by Law Forward and a few and other- Alder Burnett, uh, it, it just it, the one thing, because obviously a lot of this conversation did occur in closed session. So I would just encourage you to make sure that we're only sharing information that, that was publicly available. Yeah, that's fair. I, I think I have to this point, but anyways, yeah, and that's a great point, Alder Johnson. Um, but I was getting to the timeline. This was, you know, October-ish, I think, September, October. Um, you know, passed a few times, different votes, different reasons, but here we are into May. And and I'm just curious what the update is our relationship with Law Forward and those two other uh, law offices. I will say, and I'll just be completely honest, yeah, I was questionable a little bit, uh, questioning some of their political objectives. Uh, they've been very public about those on her, her Facebook page. They've made, made a lot of references to right-wing attacks and whatnot. So that's what I'm concerned about. They, they were formed in October in 2020. They were very public about them forming to be an objection or a counterpunch to the conservative or right wing movement. And I just don't want to enter into another election season by retaining law department help from a, a group that has a very obvious, in my opinion, political perspective that I just think we need to be completely neutral and so I just really want to know what the update is from our the law department. Do we need to retain them? Can we just say thanks for your service? And we're going to move on. We're going to take care of this stuff on our own now that we are fully staffed in the law department. Attorney Bunger. I don't think I, yeah. Sure. So um, uh, preliminarily, my recommendation at this point probably would be to to refer to staff so that staff can take a step, a step back to kind of prepare a summary as far as all the work that has been done by Law Forward um, thus far. Just to clarify, um, Law Forward's um, <clears throat> representation agreement was limited in scope to assist the law department in handling any additional November 2020 litigation. Because um, at that point, we just had um, a lot on our plate um, and weren't able to appropriately respond to all the litigation that was stemming specifically from the November 2020 election. So. The only representation that they have provided us was um, any litigation related to that election specifically. <clears throat> um, and as I provided an update to council um, and as, as is public record, the um, recent WEC complaint um, by Sipes was um, dismissed by WEC. So with that winding down um, um, and the, um, the Gableman writ action pending in the Waukesha court, being um, uh, towards the end, at least at the circuit court level, it's um, briefs are due and the hearing is set for mid-July. Um, staff has already started kind of pre preliminarily um, reflecting as far as how to wrap up representation. So we can certainly kind of look at next steps to see um, when um, that representation could potentially be um, 
uh, tied up, so to speak, um, and ended with respect to the, uh, the pendency of November 2020 related action. <laughs> So if I could, mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, so are you stating, I, Attorney Bungard, that it is possible that we could just discontinue services received in a very short amount of time? I don't know if you Short said amount that. of time, right. It, it's difficult to say. Um, right now, we would kind of need to review how much work is left um, in the current pending actions um, and kind of anticipated what is, is still anticipated that could potentially still come forward and whether our staff would have um, the capability of being, being able to handle any subsequent matters, um, you know, beyond a circuit court um, hearing, um, and if anything is, is moving into an appellate or even Supreme Court level um, litigation phases, um, as, as that is, is, is a different realm of, of practice. Um, so again, um, I think just referring to staff, we can take a look at everything and, and um, kind of present a, a timeline I, that would be most efficient um, and moving forward and wrapping things up. Right. No questions at the time for me. Lord Galvin. Uh, for Attorney Bungard, um, even though most of this seems to be wrapping up, I think you alluded to the fact that this could be appealed to higher courts. Um, I know our staff, very well educated. Uh, I believe pretty darn good employees, but are they subject matter experts on this type of law? Or are we better served by having someone that is helping us out? Um, right, right, so that it's difficult to say, certainly appellate level briefing and appellate level work and Supreme Court um, briefing and Supreme Court level um, appeals um, is, is its own niche um, in legal practice um, and very time consuming and, and work intensive. So that's definitely something that um, that we would likely pursue or, or seek additional assistance with. Um, is that it, it's just not something that uh, our internal staff would be able to handle. Um, however, we kind of have to regroup and, and see what the likelihood is of that and kind of what the time span would be so that we would be better prepared and kind of presenting options to, to counsel as far as this particular representation. <clears throat> and, and, and what is our backlog like? Um, currently for our staff. Right, so currently we, we are still um, short staffed in the sense that our municipal prosecutor is on leave um, and she returns mid June. Um, and we did hire a new attorney who's, you know, who's still being trained um, and kind of brought up to speed. Um, that would be our legislative attorney, that's ACA Logan Wood. Um, so he is being, you know, trained by um, ACA Mather who was, you know, performing, you know, for a short amount of time, she was performing three roles where she is covering the municipal prosecutor, um, still handling all the legislative roles and handling the litigation. So she is slowly handing those projects off, but it'll it'll be at least at least three or four more months until everybody is functioning at a at a regular speed and pace where everybody's just kind of focusing on their own projects where we can actually start really, really um, significantly and, and meaningfully uh, tackling our, our backlog. Okay, so our backlog, and I, I don't know if it's possible to put a timeline on it, but what are we looking at? Six months, a year, year and a half, two years? Without, um, without as far as completing the backlog, right, that's, yeah, that's hard to say. Any, any you right. know, new, massive <clears throat> right. records requests and everything else. Right, right. I mean, we are anticipating that the summer is going to be quite busy. Um, we have liquor license renewals coming up. Um, we're also in a reval year, year so uh, there's a board of review that's, that has to be prepared for for the fall. And obviously we have a partisan primary in August and a midterm election in November. And then we have budgets. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot that needs to be accomplished and, um, um, over the next several months. So I'm hoping to have you know, staff up to speed um, and, and kind of functioning um, where you know, each, each attorney is really um, not necessarily siloed because we're too small to silo ourselves in our projects, but at least where we have our new hires kind of, you know, with their feet um, underneath them, so to speak, and kind of functioning on their own. Um, so 
it would be a guess at this point, Alder Galvin, as far as when, like, I've been trying, I've been here now, it'll be nine years in December, and every year we've been trying to tackle our backlog, and it just seems to be, you know, something always comes up, um, something that's more pressing, our priorities are constantly shifting, that's, that's just kind of the nature of municipal law. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Alder Burnett? Uh, I can let Alder's story go if, if you want. Uh, Alder Johnson oh. raises his hand. Marky Mark, you're up. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alder Burnett. I just had a quick question for Attorney Bunger. Um, and I know that a lot of the Alders we have put in communications, we have a, we've been waiting for certain ordinances and things like that over a period of time. Do you have a list of, of those and in, in the time frames and things that you could share with, with the council uh, as far as where you're at with some of these various uh, projects, so to speak? Sure, I can, we can, staff can kind of take a look. We do have a running, we have a, a, a spreadsheet, a detailed spreadsheet as far as all the ordinances that have been requested and kind of priorities and timeline. Um, and uh, we have the, the ethics code coming to the ethics board on Thursday. Um, and, you know, hopes are there after that tackling um, the massage ordinances is, is the other one that's going to, that's being addressed mm -hmm. by attorney Mike May. So now if he's finished up with ethics, he can turn his attention to that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, to get that over the finish line and obviously uh, addressing chapter four, which formerly was chapter 33 with liquor licensing. Yes. Um, along with a lot of other, <laughs> a lot. Our hope is now that we have the legislative attorney, but obviously we have to hand over projects to him to kind of get him up to speed as far as where everything is at. Um, and all of that was on hold because we were so litigation heavy for the last couple of years and our legislative attorney who should have been just focusing on legislative stuff had to be pulled off into into litigation which is where outside counsel help has helped a lot in kind of carrying the heavier, heavier burden with the drafting and then and the research because that it literally can take weeks and weeks and weeks right. and weeks there's issues um, with that and problems so I, in time frames i understand that i think the biggest thing is just for Council to realize what's out there, what are you working on, yep. and possibly maybe even a line of description just saying, okay, we're it's at this point right now, or we're waiting for this, or whatever. Just some some little information that we can use that will help us. Okay, we can do that. We can do that. All right, that's all. Thank you. Great, Alder Burnett. Yeah, uh, thank you. And um, I think we just need to be very narrow and focus on what they said they would do, and if it goes mm -hmm. to the November 2020 election. Obviously, there's a lot of attention that Green Bay is drawing. We just saw, and I'm not trying to be political in any way, because as far as I think, city government should be as neutral as possible, as nonpartisan as possible. But we are battleground for a lot of very partisan initiative. We're battleground for partisan crap. I don't like it. I don't think anyone likes it. We saw what happened with the Green Bay, with the recent city council elections, tens of thousands of dollars from outside money coming in from both directions. The fact that we have a political organization that perhaps is defending us from other political people, it makes me uneasy, right? And I just think that had they not had the history of posting things that they're posting on social media and things they're advocating from, from a very special interest of political agenda, I just think that the quicker we can dispense of them and start and just say, we're just gonna we're just going to remove all special interest political groups from this election process all the way around. We can't, we can't control the complaints that come to us. We know that. But I just, I want to be very, very specific on what law court is doing. And I don't want them embedded in city government any way whatsoever as we lead up to the November 2000. We're going to be ground zero for a lot of crap in, in the city. Excuse my language. I just want to remove all drama as we can as possible hopefully start fresh so did you get a motion there staff, okay. yeah refer to staff uh, to work with Alderman Burnett uh, um, to bring forward to the Common Council second all right Galvin you had your your hand raised did you want to speak again or are you good with the motion no, uh, I'm just seconding the motion okay we need to move this on any further discussion seeing all those in favor say aye aye, aye. Opposed, motion carries. Item F, informational. Item one, 2022 contingency account. Still at $200,000. Good work. 
Item number two, the next finance committee meeting will be held on Tuesday, May 24th, 2022 at 4.30 p.m. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. We have Galvin and Hutchison is for the second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Good job, guys. All right. Good night, all. Thanks. Thank you, staff.